So uh, this is my, my first time participating in the conference. I've never been to any of the other incarnations. I'm so glad that it came to Seattle uh, because that made it really easy for somebody from Valve to come across Lake Washington and speak with all of you guys. I'm going to jump right in. There's really four big topics I'm going to try to cover today. Uh, a quick platform overview with some stats and information and a little bit of advice. Uh, a couple slides about Steam Direct, kind of how it's going so far and, and what it looks like. And then we're going to talk about big updates. Uh, updates coming to the storefront and also updates coming to the client. And there's a good mix there between things that are really super customer focused and should be interesting to you as developers and then things that are specifically developer oriented features. And I'm going to go pretty fast so that we have time for Q&A because usually that's the most interesting part for a lot of folks anyway. So jumping right into the platform overview, uh, it's no secret that Steam has grown uh, pretty well over the last few years. We're averaging about 14 million concurrent users a day. Um, and to put that into context, if you go back a couple years, we were at around half of that, around eight, eight and a half million a day. So we're really excited with the way that the platform has grown in terms of users. Uh, there's now, I think, 67 million monthly active players. Those are customers that own games on Steam and are installing them and playing them. So that doesn't account for a bot account or an account that doesn't own any items or products on Steam. The stat that we're really excited about is uh, in a little more than a year and a half, we've added about 28 million new first-time purchasers. So those are customers who, for the first time ever, made a new account and then bought a product from the Steam storefront or made a transaction inside of a free-to-play game. So these are real customers, about a million and a half a month coming to our platform. And we think that's a, a really exciting thing. The nice counterpoint to that is that we're not just bringing new customers in for the first time, but our existing customers are interacting with the platform more and more. We've shared this data before, but this is a graph of the annual average package purchasers per customer. A lot of words in there. It basically boils down to how many new games are customers buying a year. Uh, and again, if you go back two or three years, we're, we're not only adding the number of users dramatically, but the customers we do have are buying about twice as many games as they did per year uh, three years ago. And I don't have the graph here, but the playtime numbers uh, follow this very well. Customers are spending about twice as much time a year playing the games that they own in addition to buying more of them. And a big reason why that's happening is because the diversity of Steam has exploded in the last few years. The number of games has increased, and that can be a scary thing for developers. We completely understand why, but it's also opened a ton of doors. Uh, the platform is at a point where you can make a game about being a car mechanic and be at the top sellers list uh, just as easily as you can make a really squad-based military shooter or a dating simulator or uh, a game where you are a rancher gathering up slimes and putting them on a farm. Uh, the sorts of games that can be successful on our platform have exploded dramatically. And a big piece of that is driven by regional changes. So this is a pie chart that we usually update and share every year. And if you've seen any of our data from years past or seen us speak at conferences, the first two pie slices look pretty much the same. North America and Western Europe have added up to about a third of our revenue in dollars every year. Um, the, the last slice of the pie is the one that has changed the most and, and gotten really interesting. If you go back a couple of years, the Russian territories accounted for 9 to 10 percent of our revenue, and it looks like that shrunk now to 5 percent. In reality, the overall amount of revenue and units has gone up significantly. It's just that the rest of the regions have also grown, that as an overall slice of the pie, Russian territories are a little bit smaller. One of the biggest growth regions has been Asia. Um, China gets a lot of attention and a lot of discussion, and it is growing really well, but the growth in Asia is driven by a lot more than China. It's also Indonesia, it's India, it's the Philippines, Japan and Korea have all seen masses, massive increases, not only in the new games, uh, excuse me, the new revenue coming to the platform, but also the games coming to the platform. And that's where localization comes in. This is one of the most commonly asked questions for people who are getting ready to launch their game on Steam. They want to know, what's the best bang for the buck in terms of localization? And I'm going to put these numbers in a little bit of context. The first thing I'm going to say is this, these percentage increases are our uh, expected average increase when you add support for a language, and they're adjusted for regional growth in that territory. So for instance, Korean 140% increase 
That doesn't mean all revenue in Korea is guaranteed to increase for your game for 140%. The region as a whole has grown dramatically. It does mean that once you add Korean language localization, we'd expect about 140% increase in that country. Um, so your own game is going to be different, and you might see slightly different results depending on the kind of game you've shipped um, and how many customers you already have in the region. So a really text-heavy, uh, character-based RPG, it's going to be more expensive to localize. It's also going to see bigger benefits. Uh, a game where there's almost no text outside of the pause menu, uh, the benefits to localization are going to be smaller, but of course the cost is going to be dramatically lower. So if you're trying to prioritize, uh, look at your own existing sales country to country, but these are the regions and languages where we would definitely recommend and where you'll see the most growth relative to how you're already doing. And all of this really flows into kind of a virtuous cycle of growth. Uh, what we saw many years ago was very challenging to get new developers from new regions to bring their games to Steam because there weren't very many customers in that region. And so all of these sort of pieces fit together on the platform. We've worked really hard to improve support for payment methods, uh, storefront localization itself, pricing games in local currencies, which makes the store a little bit friendlier for developers, which brings more customers from their region to the store, who of course then turn around and buy games from developers from other countries, which makes the opportunity bigger for developers in that country, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we're really excited every time we bring new developers and new types of games to the platform, we're also bringing new customers into the platform. And that's a big reason why that diversity explosion has been so successful. So the big takeaway, uh, there's a huge global audience on Steam. They're very hungry for games, and they're buying and playing more and more of them as years go by. The next thing I'm going to really focus on is distribution. And this is uh, mostly going to be about Steam Direct, which many of you probably are already vaguely familiar with, at least. In years past, getting your game on Steam has not been necessarily easy. A long time ago, it was a sort of black box process with almost no transparency or insight. Then we changed to Steam Greenlight, which was risky and unpredictable, but also gave you a huge amount of uh, community exposure. And we've tried to listen to as much of the developer feedback as we can, both from developers who have never launched a game on Steam and the people who they're on their fifth or sixth game to really make things easier. And that's the root of Steam Direct. It launched a little more than a, about a month and a half ago. It's a very streamlined and predictable process. Whatever country you live in, whether you've launched a game before or you haven't, um, it's a straightforward process that you know you can bring your game to Steam. And it's available worldwide. So the process itself is pretty straightforward. You're going to sign some digital paperwork, uh, our distribution agreement. You're going to put down a $100 recoupable fee, which means you put down the money up front. And once you start selling your game on Steam, you earn that money back. It's not a revenue generation tool for Valve. Uh, and then there's a brief app review, which I'll talk about in a second. And then finally, you can release your game uh, once you're ready. And the interesting thing about the app review for us, it's, it's not an onerous cert process. It's actually a, kind of a, an added level of, of QA and, and confidence. So one of the things we saw happen a lot as we opened the doors to Steam a little bit wider was developers would come and launch their game, and there'd be issues on the store page, or a trailer wasn't playing back correctly or the developer indicated that Mac was supported, but they didn't actually upload the Mac files to, uh, to the store correctly, and so on and so forth. So our build and store page review is really designed not as a cert, but as a, an ensurement that when you press the launch button, customers will get what they see on the store page and be able to play it and have a smooth experience uh, on day one. The other piece of big updates that shipped alongside Steam Direct was really overhauling our way of su supporting you developers. Um, our documentation site was out of date. It was hard to navigate. Search didn't work that well. Uh, we kind of had to own those mistakes and, and spend some time looking at what the developers really need, especially as the platform scales up. So we overhauled the display of the documentation, uh, went through and rewrote a bunch of articles, updated things that were out of date. Um, and did an entire overhaul on the API documentation itself. So when you show up to the Steamworks documentation, good news if you're new to Steam as a developer, it's all publicly available even if you haven't signed up yet. Um, so you can learn about the features, the API, our policies, our guidelines, even before you've signed any agreements with us or distributed your game on Steam. The other piece of that process for us has been a new developer help site. So this is a way for any developer, again, even if you haven't onboarded to Steam yet, you can quickly and easily 
uh, get a hold of the right people at Valve. Whether you've got a technical question, you need advice on something on your store page, uh, something's gone wrong while you're uploading your build and you're stuck, uh, it's now really easy to click in and set up a message directly to Valve. And those messages are bucketed out to the right people. So instead of emailing me and having me forward your email to six other people and three days later hearing back, we've tried to make the process a lot simpler and, and more direct for you. And once you've signed up for Steam, you get a lot back. Uh, you get access to all of the APIs for integrating with the platform and, of course, all of our platform level features. And all of those features are free and they're all optional. So that means if you want to take advantage of the Steam inventory service, uh, you can. It's quick, it's easy, and it's free. On the other hand, if you've built your own inventory solution for in-game items, we're fine with that. And you can ship that on Steam even if you developed it yourself or it's middleware that you've bought from somebody else. Uh, the PC is an open platform, and Steam provides a bunch of services that you can sort of pick and choose whatever solves problems for you. So if we can save you some money or we can save you some time, Take advantage of those features. If it's something you want to build yourself or you need to build yourself, that's fine and we're open to it. Uh, the other thing you get is, of course, access to Steamworks, the website. So you can manage your store presence. Um, we have hour by hour financial reporting and Steam key activations. Uh, and that, of course, leads me to Steam keys themselves. You're not only selling your game on the Steam store, but optionally, if you wish to do this, you can request Steam keys to sell at physical retail or on other digital stores. The one thing I want to say on that note, Steam has never really believed in exclusivity and we would never ask you for it. Uh, whether or not you use Steam keys is completely up to you. And uh, there's no penalty for launching on other stores, PC or otherwise. If you're trying to decide should you be selling your game on uh, GOG or Itch or Green Man Gaming or whatever store you choose to work with, that's completely fine. If you want to use Steam keys and they solve a problem for you, that's great. If you want to sell through some other method, that's okay too. Uh, none of those factors weigh into how your game is treated by the Steam store. So the big takeaway, we've made it a lot easier and a lot more predictable to sign up for Steam. And one thing I neglected to mention, if you're an existing partner and you're making Universe Sandbox 3, uh, you can go into the process, set up the app ID for Universe Sandbox 3, which uh, that not, I'm not trying to reveal a, a launched uh, a hidden title from Dan or anything. Uh, you can easily set up your new app ID to get started with beta testing, uh, test out new features, start integrating with the platform early. So you can do that at whatever pace works for you and your company. So the next two sections here are really all about updates. Um, a lot of this that I'm going to be talking about is work in progress that hasn't shipped yet. It's subject to change. Um, valve time, hardy har har, it might take a while to ship. But uh, the biggest thing for us is exposing some of the information now and trying to do a better job of talking about it as we go. So a lot of these store and client features will hopefully be launching into uh, beta and also we'll try to do some platform updates about, hey, this is coming down the pipeline, here's how to use it. Uh, so I'll just dig right in. The store has changed a lot. Um, we used to launch, you know, Launching three games in a week was a big week for us once upon a time, and now you know, three games probably launched since the time I started this presentation. The store has changed. It's important for us to be realistic about that. So our big goals are making sure that we're staying focused on customers and their experience on the store. We want to make sure they can find the right games for them, and we want to arm them with enough information and data to where they can make informed decisions and feel really confident about the games that they're buying and jump right in and have fun. Uh, and the last piece of the puzzle for us, game development itself has changed a lot. Uh, games as a service is a real thing. Increasingly, games don't really look like a movie or a book where you finish this thing and then you put it out into the market and never change it again. So we've tried to evolve the store and the client to accommodate that so that customers can stay engaged with a game for many months or years after it releases uh, and participate in its ongoing development. So, one of the big pieces of our approach is just expanding the personalization of the store. Many of you, it's looked like a lot of people already have Steam accounts, and you might have done some of this yourself. You can go in and adjust your language preferences so that Steam shows you games that are localized in the language you prefer. You can choose not to see certain types of content uh, and genres and tags. Um, we're also working on a full overhaul of our, recommend our recommendation engine. So this is the tool right now that primarily drives things like the discovery queue, the games you see in your front page on Steam. I think one thing that gets overlooked a lot is the Steam store page is different for every single customer. 
Uh, so the idea of this monolithic store where there are 10 top selling games and 10 featured games and nothing else ever gets to be seen, um, that's just not appropriate for the diversity of the Steam platform or the diversity of our audience. So we've made a lot of changes like regionalizing top sellers and making all of the um, recommended games that you see completely dynamic. So when you log into Steam, the content that you see is tailored for you. Um, we're doing a big overhaul to make those recommendations even smarter and faster, and then continuing to iterate on existing features. And one of the ones we've got the biggest updates planned for is curators. We've talked about this a little bit. We invited some top curators to Valve to just vent and tell us what they love about the system, what they hate about it. Um, and if you're not familiar with curators already, some of the more popular ones here on the screen already. Myself, I follow Indie Megabooth, and I follow Tech Raptor. And as a result, when I log into the Steam store, about a third of the games that I see in my discovery queue are recommended by one of the curators or more that I follow. So it's a pretty big impulse into what games and what content I see, uh, but the feature's not done, and it really needs a lot of love, and that's what we're kind of working on next. So one of the things we want to do is make it easier for new personalities to rise. If you're Total Biscuit and you've already got a huge audience, you can set up a curator and have lots of followers quickly. Um, but if you're new, curators need a little bit of help being discovered. And we also want to make it easier to support niches and subgenres of games. So here's some of the upcoming updates. Um, one of the big ones is we want to make sure that it's easier to highlight off Steam content. So if you're a Twitch streamer or a, a Mixer streamer or you have a YouTube channel or you're just a traditional journalist who's writing articles, we want to make sure it's easier for your off Steam content to show up in the platform on your curator page. Um, and we also want to make it easier for you to make sub lists. So the examples uh, that were, were mocked up here, it might be hard to see, especially if you're at the back, but sub lists like, hey, these are games that I kickstarted, really interesting crowdfunded games that I recommend. Uh, these are games with awesome Steam Workshop support. So if you're into user-generated content and mods, check these ones out, uh, and so on and so forth. So we really want to give curators a lot more control and power over what they're showing off. But the other side of that coin is giving developers a little bit more tools. So one thing that doesn't exist now that we're working on is making it easier for Steamworks developers to search for curators. If you know that you're making a, um, a roguelike platformer and you want to find the most popular roguelike platformer curators, it's very difficult to do that right now and we want to make your life a lot easier. Um, the same goes for Linux curators or curators of games that are uh, support Korean or whatever the case may be. The other thing we want to do is make it easier to verify people through curator systems so you kind of know who you're working with and know that uh, this is actually PC Gamer and not somebody who drag and dropped the PC Gamer logo into a Steamworks group. Um, the biggest piece of that for developers, in terms of verified things, is making it easier for you to put your game in front of curators directly through Steam. Um, so these are features that are still in development and a little bit speculative, but the idea would be if I'm working on a game, I have some you know, set of tokens or opportunities to put my game in front of curators directly through Steam without trying to email them or send them a Steam key or risk getting... Uh, having that Steam key get stolen or misused, and put the game directly in front of curators in Steam so that they can access it quickly and easily and uh, recommend it a little bit more fluidly. We get that question often from devs, how do I reach out to these awesome curators? And right now the answer is, you know, find them elsewhere on the internet, look them up, contact them through their YouTube channels, whatever the case may be. We really want to bring that into Steam itself to make your life a little bit easier and uh, more reliable. The other big category of uh, changes to the Steam store itself is really focusing around events. And again, this is hearkening back to what I mentioned earlier around games as a service, games that are going through ongoing development, changing over time. This has become an increasingly important thing for developers to take advantage of. Uh, and so this mock-up shows what an, uh, uh, an event page might look for a given customer. When they log into Steam, they can see what's coming down the pipeline. So a game they play has a double XP weekend, or uh, a new hero just launched in the game that they play, or whatever the case may be, making it a lot easier for you as developers to put that information in front of users. We have a feature now called Update Visibility Rounds, and they're really useful for connecting to people who have wishlisted your game or already own it, but they kind of live on the store alongside a bunch of other information. They don't stand out in a special way. And so building this events sort of hub for customers is what we think is going to be a really useful step. 
that also makes it easier for us to provide you with tools for like notifications and reminders that some special event is coming down the line. So there's a number of big updates coming. Uh, they're all designed around making sure it's easier to connect players with the right games. Some of those tools are customer specific, others are developer specific, but they all feed back into that overarching goal. The other big category of updates coming down is to the Steam client itself. Same preface as I gave earlier, a lot of this work is in progress. Um, we're working on things as they come in and we'll probably try to run betas and expose some of this via platform updates. Uh, as it gets developed and, and open things up to feedback. But what we're able to share for now is the Steam client has looked pretty much the same for a while, so we're doing an overall UI refresh, um, bringing, bringing it into the modern era and updating things. And for developers, the real biggest changes are in the library. Uh, if you spend a lot of time playing games on Steam right now, you know the library is a fairly basic uh, display. There's not a lot of magic there, and you as developers don't have a lot of control over what shows up there. Even though Steam as a whole has this huge, massive amount of rich content about your game, almost none of it shows up when a customer views your game in their library, an existing owner. And so we're really hoping to uh, increase that experience. The first one, the first way we're going to do that is by improving the library home experience. We want to make sure that if you've been playing a game, you can jump right back into it quickly and easily. We also want to make it a lot easier to see activity on other games in your library. Some of that's the events that I mentioned earlier, but a lot of it is really the viral social connections that develop on Steam. That boils down to seeing when your friends are unlocking achievements more easily, seeing what games your friends have wishlisted or purchased. You can see that information now on Steam, but it's often a secondary tab called activity. Um, and so a lot of these changes are really about grabbing the awesome rich content from other places in Steam and making sure it shows up in the library view for customers. The other big change uh, around the game launch pa page is, is what I started mentioning, really bringing in these other features and elements so that instead of having to navigate to eight or nine different tabs in a community hub, you can see a really rich update of information right in the library view itself for a given game. And so there's a fresh new Steam client UI coming. Uh, no mockups to show just yet, um, but we want to make it a lot easier for your customers to connect with you and for you to build a business over time. It's been really exciting for us to see the rise in games where they have more players a year after launch than they did at release, uh, which was almost unheard of five years ago and is now becoming sort of a hallmark of, of successful games. So that's pretty much the wrap up for me. I think that I've left enough time to do some questions, but uh, you guys can kick me off stage if I'm wrong about that. Uh, the big, biggest takeaways is we really want developers to be considering Steam throughout their uh, development cycle as they're building your game. I really want to reemphasize, if you just launched a game on PlayStation 4 and you're thinking about a port, it's very, very easy to start poking around on Steamworks, read the documentation, figure out what's possible. Uh, if you're brand new developing a game that you haven't even shown to anybody yet, it's equally just as easy to get set up with an app ID, start getting uh, beta testing Steam keys so you can hand out the game more easily to friends uh, securely, whatever the case may be. It's really easy to get set up, and we think we've got a lot of great stuff coming. Uh, the last piece is we really do want to hear from developers like you guys. Part of that is QA at an event, um, but a lot of it is just trying to do a better job at showing up to events like these and, and having the conversations that spark the next great Steam feature or the feedback we need to improve the developer experience. So with that in mind, uh, thanks again for coming. I don't know how much time we have for QA, but anybody who wants to line up at the mic up front, please do. Uh, and if you're interested in following up, the top link here, steamdevdays.com, we host a big developer conference called Dev Days. You can listen to obnoxious people like me talk about the business side of things. You can also get a lot of really great insight on running a good early access game or what's working in VR, et cetera. All the talks and panels are available for free at devdays.com. And partner.steamgames.com is the main homepage. So if you're an existing partner, you can go there to see documentation. If you're new, you can read all the details on Steam Direct and download our SDK and read about uh, the tools and features. So that's all I've got. If anybody has questions, come on up. Okay, don't be shy. Come and line up at the microphone at the front. Big round of applause now for sort of Tom. Here you keep up. So well, as I'm waiting for people to sort of come down, I will start off the, the first question. So, Content is king, but sort of distribution is God. We're all aware that visibility of a game is the most important thing for indie game developers. And when there's a 
tidal wave, a tsunami of sort of content. Finding those diamond in the rough is hard. So mm -hmm. you've got this curator program, but like, it's like a matryoshka. You, you're kind of pushing the things downstream. Who curates the curators, and how do you sort of get involved in that sort of stage? And what, yeah. can you tell a little bit about that? That's a really, that's a really interesting question. So uh, one of the one of the problems, the fundamental problems with curators is how do you find a good curator that that works for you? And so we've been trying to talk a little bit more internally about creative ways to surface curators in a context that makes sense. Um, if all you're doing this week is playing Player Unknown's Battlegrounds and we try to pop up curator recommendations to you, that's just a window to be closed and ignored. Um, so one of the things, for instance, that we're trying to do is put recommendations and suggestions into better context. One of the things we've talked about that doesn't exist yet and might never exist um, is, for instance, if you're playing a game and you really enjoy it, you enjoy it so much that you leave a positive user review. Once you post that user review, we'd like to show something that says, hey, it looks like you really liked this game. Um, so does the, uh, the sci-fi fantasy curator. Uh, it looks like you guys might have tastes in common. Or when you buy a new game saying, hey, you now own four different games that this curator has recommended, you might be interested in checking them out. So it's really getting a lot more uh, dynamic and, and in touch with customers. Putting 10 games up on the store page and hoping all 67 million people browsing the store this month are going to like them, it's not going to happen. We've got to get a lot smarter and a lot more personalized with users. And also make recommendations when psychologically the, the door is open. It's an actually appropriate time to say, hey, now that you've indicated how much you like something, um, here's another thing you might like or here's another way to find good content for you. Um, that said, we'll never be done with that process. We'll always be trying to improve it and, and make it better. Yeah. Hey, hi there. Uh, I was wondering if you're capable to share the numbers of games, uh, generally speaking, that are actually played that people have bought. Like, what's the percentage of time and how many games are never played? That's a really good bought? question. Uh, I, don't, I don't know off the top of my head, but I think it's something we'd probably be happy to share. Do you mind me asking why you want to know? Like, what's the... I've, well, I've roughly got about 300 games in my library. And Thank you. I've played <laughs> three. <laughs> well, I'm a developer, right? Yeah, so you don't have I, time. Most people in here, they don't play games. We yeah. make games, so it's... Yeah. I, but it is a common problem. It's a meme. You know, people yeah. joke about it. So I was wondering if yeah. you had those, those numbers. It's a really good question. Uh, that's, that's something I think maybe would be interesting for us to look into and share. I don't know off the top of my head. I'm not trying to be coy or, or dodge. I just really don't know. But I think it'd be interesting to take a closer look. Um, one of the things that we've tried to get more insight from developers about is uh, how sad are you if somebody bought your game and never plays it like, or doesn't play it in the first month? I think if you're making a cooperative multiplayer game and a third of your customers who bought it never play it, that's a, that's a scary stat, right? That represents an actual threat to your ongoing health of your game. Whereas for a lot of other developers, it's like, hey, if my game's been out six months. You picked it up in the sale because it was you know, $6. Uh, if you don't play it for a year, that's kind of OK. If you're just collecting it and you want it on your shelf, that's OK. So I think the type of game is really relevant also to that question. I think there's plenty of games where it's not an existential threat if only a third of your buyers played the game in the first week, and other games where that would be a really bad place to be. So, good question, though. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Hi. Uh, Hello. Ready to talk. Um, we make VR games, and we want to know if you have any thoughts on that. Because it's really foggy still, so yeah. you, you can lift some of that fog yeah. up. So, uh, full disclosure, I personally don't do a lot of work on the VR side of our business. Uh, and I'm not really a great spokesperson for VR generally. But the two things I would say that are really important to know is, number one, we internally are uh, extremely excited and investing very heavily in VR. We don't have a whole lot to say about that uh, publicly yet, but we don't. <laughs> We don't, see, we don't see VR as a, a wave that has peaked and is now going to evaporate. Um, so we're putting a lot of our own resources into uh, content and features and things to continue moving, uh, moving forward. Knuckles is a piece of that that we've talked about a little bit more uh, publicly. Those are the new controllers. Um, but there's a lot coming in the pipeline from us that I'm not a great person to really explain okay. or talk about. Um, in terms of the game space, 
I think the really interesting question for developers is figuring out uh, what sort of games haven't been made yet. So for me personally, I spend a lot of time playing VR games. And there's a couple of games. For me, Space Pirate Trainer is I've yet to have an experience that I like more than that. And so my question as a customer is kind of like, OK, what's the game that comes out that I like more than Space Pirate Trainer? Because in the non-VR space, that happens all the time for me. Literally every week, there's a new game where I'm like, wow. Like, I thought I would only ever play Dead Cells, and here comes something else that's awesome and fun and exciting. In VR, that rate is much slower. And I don't think I'm alone as a VR customer in that space. So both we as a platform and you as developers, the real question is, how do we get to that point where there's a new great game coming out every week that really drives, drives people? Um, but keep your, keep your ear to the ground over the next yeah. six months or more for Valve to talk a lot more about our plans in okay. VR. OK, thanks. Yeah, thanks for coming. I feel like it's a long walk, just like just ten, <laughs> 10 steps. Thanks so much for the talk. Yeah. So my question is, let me devil, uh, devil's advocate here with my typical situation. I tend to load a couple of games and load Discord and go to it. And my gaming experience often is close out these annoying Steam windows and get right to that experience. Mm -hmm. And I say this because I ask, what do you guys see in terms of the options that we as players or developers seek um, add to our game that have nothing to do with Steam that makes Steam perhaps less essential. You know, there is quite yeah. a percentage that comes off if I'm putting my game on sale at Steam as opposed to whatever else may pop up in the next 6, 12, 18 months between sure. Twitch getting in there and everybody else. So what is it that you guys are doing specifically to fight that value that we get from a lot of third party services that aren't asking for that cut? Yeah, the answer. That's, a really, that's a really good question, a really fair one. Uh, I should answer it first by stating a common conversation and a common topic for us is, are we doing a good enough job to continue to earn that over time? And so for us, it's, it's uh, Sisyphus. We push the rock to the top of the hill on a feature, and the next morning, there's a rock at the bottom of the hill to push back up. Um, I think the two biggest things I would point to is, number one, uh, what was really common, especially 2013, 14, 15, was pulling things from our own games and figuring out how do we make that broadly available. So Dota 2 has done something really interesting, and a lot of developers are knocking on our door saying, hey, we want that in our game. Uh, can, we have, can we have that? Um, and so continuing to build things in that respect has been really useful. I think uh, the easiest example of that for me to talk about is the Steam inventory service. Uh, where you can have a back end, you can have items that are traded, you can have workshop contributions that are paid out to lots of different people, um, which we can do that, that most other platforms can't. But the other piece of it, I think Discord is an interesting one to talk about, and Twitch is another, where we have to make sure that Steam is still a really valuable place for customers to actually connect about games. Um, if all it ever does for you is launch your product, then it becomes a lot less interesting and a lot less valuable. Um, we have a few different features, things like Steam Broadcast, that are uh, not really deliberately a direct competition with other platform features on other areas. But I think the biggest question for us is to, to keep that wheel turning. I think there's going to be some amount of follow on. Other people do creative things, and we think, what's the Steam version of that? Or how do we make a, a version of that that works well in Steam? And the other version is continuing to innovate ourselves. Uh, our own game development has driven a lot of that in the past, but we as a platform have to have to keep doing it. So, good question. Hi there. <clears throat> Just a quick question about your review system. And now you mentioned before that you know Steam keys are ours to give away or you know sell elsewhere. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it is still my understanding. Now I might be a month or two behind on this. That those products then get this. This is, product has been reviewed for free and that score does not count towards the overall Steam review score? Correct? Yeah, so there's a subset of um, if a user acquires the game through a Steam key mm -hmm. and they leave a user review, it shows up, it can be upvoted and downvoted and anything else, people can comment on it, um, but it does show that it was from a key and it doesn't count towards the user review score at the top of your page, uh, whereas the, this product was reviewed for free is something that people, is it a checkbox for uh, press to disclose, hey, I re received this product for free. So a customer who bought the game from, via a Steam key from another store uh, wouldn't necessarily be checking that box. 
So that doesn't get counted. So if they don't tick that checkbox, it counts towards your overall score? Uh, the checkbox is unrelated. It's basically if you bought the game on the Steam store, your user review counts towards the score. And if you bought it somewhere else or acquired it somewhere else, it doesn't. Whether you acquired it for free or not is irrelevant. So does that go against that idea of us being able to sell those, say, at a convention or so forth, where it's like, I want to sell yeah. copies of that, and then all of a sudden those customers or pre-purchases don't then count? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we, so far, we haven't actually seen that to be true. So one of the areas um, that a lot of people asked a different version of this question was around crowdfunding. Like, hey, I, you know, I got $100,000 from my program on FIG, or I've got 10,000 users from Kickstarter. Are you telling me none of those users actually count towards the user review score? And that was kind of a scary thing that we had to go back and look like, hey, is this actually playing out? Are there games where they have a bunch of happy Kickstarter customers who have positively reviewed the game, but none of that's flushing through to their actual Steam customers? And generally speaking, we just haven't seen it make a difference. In other words, uh, let's say you had 100 Steam key reviews and your percentage was about 80%. We've seen the purchasing on Steam be about 80%. So your score has ended up being about the same. And then because we still show the reviews, users can scroll down and get a really good look at all of the information and people's opinions. Um, it is a hard trade-off, though. We made a conscious decision to say, hey, the risk of manipulating user review scores with keys is so high that we're going to make uh, it a little bit less of an input for people who maybe acquired the game legitimately. So it's not an easy trade-off to make. We think it was the right one. Um, and like any decision we make, we're probably not done with user reviews. We're going to keep making sure it's easy to get accurate, reliable information about a game. Um, but really good question. All right, thanks. Yeah. Hey, Tom. Great talk. Thank you. Um, on the subject of the recommendation engine and the, the, uh, the curators, yeah. you know, it's been a popular topic in the past year uh, that in our news and social media, we have these self-reinforcing cultural bubbles that form. Yes. Has Valve done any research into this uh, and whether or not that's a good or bad thing for games? You know, how, uh, it seems like the more accurate the recommendations get, the more narrow the genres I'm going to be exposed yeah. to. So how do, how, do we, how do we expose games that people may not uh, totally. ordinarily play that they may, they may actually really enjoy yeah. to them? The, the good news here is because we sort of eat our own dog food, we all spend a ton of time on Steam, we see this happening. And it's one of the things, like me personally, I'm very vocal about changing, is like when the Dota 2 International happens, and I'm like launching the Dota client all the time, and I'm really involved in it, my storefront changes in a way that I don't really expect or want. Suddenly, every game in my you know, recommendations is a free-to-play game. And that's not what I'm telling you by launching Dota a bunch. It doesn't say I'm looking for free-to-play games. Um, the same thing happens with Netflix, right? My wife and I watched the, uh, the O.J. Simpson document, uh, not a documentary, but the TV show about O.J. Simpson. And suddenly, our, all of our recommendations were like true crime. So I mean, it's like, that's not what I was telling you when I watched this. Uh, I was really interested in a cool TV drama. I don't only want to watch uh, murder investigations anymore. So well, we're completely on board with that same issue. It's a little different from the Facebook style like political echo chamber, but in an entertainment lens, it ends up being the same problem, where the only games you're going to see are roguelike platformers, um, if, that's, if you've been playing a lot of Dead Cells lately. Uh, and that defeats a lot of the value of the diversity of Steam. So I think the really big challenge for us is figuring out how to do both. If you want to do a really deep dive on a certain type of visual novel, it should be pretty easy for you to find a curator who's good at recommending that or, or a list that helps you find that. At the same time, though, when you play Dream Daddy Dating Simulator, that doesn't mean the only games you want to play are dating simulators on Steam. So it's absolutely top of mind and one of the goals for updating the recommendations. Really good question. Five minutes. Such a question. So this be Five minutes. All right. Uh, hopefully, this is a fast one. So you said before that getting on Steam was a bit of a black box, and now there's a lot more games, and the discovery mechanisms are more important than ever. Yeah. But those seem like the new black box to some extent. So is there any guidance you can give us as we're designing games and trying to figure out how to market them to make those algorithms work for us so that we don't get lost yeah. in that noise. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, and I haven't really thought about it in that lens before, but I think you're right. Like, If the old scary, confusing thing was, uh, how do I get Tom at Valve to pick my game out of a hat and, and let it launch, the new scary thing is, how do I know that my game's going to show up to the right people? Um, one thing that's very concrete 
is localization. And that's something that'll supersede pretty much everything else about the recommendations. So if I have a Steam account and I've said, hey, I speak Bulgarian um, and that's my language preference, any game that has Bulgarian support is gonna be more likely to show up to me as a result. Um, so localization has become increasingly important. It's also something that we on the on sort of back end side see as a more emerging trend of popularity. So there are games that are number one in the top sellers in Japan and not even in the top 50 in Russia. And the store has gotten a lot smarter to reflect that so that you can get some of those network effects regionally or if you have language support in one place or another. Um, so that's one thing, regardless of the genre of game, regardless of uh, what your user review score is or anything else, that's a big piece of the puzzle. I'm hesitant to say too much more because a lot of the recommendation stuff are changing, but honestly, that, that's the question we needed to hear at a show like this is, um, there's a balance of sharing information, which of course all of you guys can imagine. If we laid out here are the 10 things that feed into the recommendations engine and at what percentage, we've also now broken the recommendations engine permanently. Um, by, by letting people manipulate it, but giving more insight into that's really important. Uh, localization will remain really important, and we think curators are gonna become more important. I mentioned, this is a purely anecdotal thing. Uh, for me, because I follow five or six curators that tend to make really good recommendations, about a third of the games that I see in my main cap and discovery queue are from my curators. Um, and so I think that's gonna be the next biggest piece of advice in addition to localization, especially as we improve the process. Whatever type of game you're making, get out there and find the five curators. Maybe they don't have the largest audience, maybe they have the right audience. Getting in front of those 1,500 customers might be way more valuable than being recommended by somebody with a million followers. Um, so, but great question and that's something I'll take back as making sure devs have long answer. Hey, uh, hey, so as you guys add more of these um, like social media e aspects to Steam, for lack of a better term, yeah. uh, are you worried at all about like pushback or criticism from the people, I guess like myself, who spend like 99% of their Steam time just like in the library, opening up a game, treating it just like they did the shelf full of SNES cartridges yeah. they had? Yeah, oh, totally. I think the, the key thing for us is letting the store still do that for you. So if you have to click through six pages of notifications or we're asking you to sign up with more curators while you're just trying to launch your game, and that's kind of what I, I tried to get across earlier. I probably didn't do that good of a job of it. There's a time and a place to show a customer what their friends are playing. There's a time and a place to recommend a new curator to them. But at the end of the day, we're very realistic that the reason customers love Steam is the games they're playing on Steam. And so our job is to facilitate that. Um, if you love playing Players Unknown Battlegrounds and that's what you want Steam to be for you this month, it should be able to serve that purpose just as easily as the customer who's like, oh my god, I've been playing way too much Dota, I need, I need to get out of my you know, corner here, let me go play something else. So we're super acutely aware that there's a huge number of customers, many of whom are spending the largest number of time and dollars who they're not really interested in chatting with friends and they don't play to unlock achievements. They're just looking for the game that they love to get back into and back into and back into. So really good question. Cool, thank you. Last question. Oh, perfect. Hey, yeah. Dan. A couple, uh, uh, two, two questions about localization. Yeah. So you were showing off uh, a list of oh, yeah. uh, languages and which ones you recommended and, or not recommended, but like. Tend to show the biggest impact. And, and is it like German, French, is that, are they like further down on that list? Yes, oh, okay. uh, they are. And honestly, we're, uh, every, once in a while we do these big platform analysis updates. So we did one around wish lists last year. Um, we did a, did a few different ones about like doing s reviews of sales. So hey, the winter sale and review, here's the revenue we saw, here's the trends we saw. We wanna do one on localization to show you that, that whole chart of where it matches up, and also do a little bit more deep diving on genres. I mentioned this earlier, but you might not see 65% uplift on your Japanese sales if you localize in Japanese, if your game basically has a pause menu and no other text. <laughs> um, right. But you had a follow-up question. Oh, well, and then I was just curious, con commentary on China, given that Steam is not officially in China? Is that true? Is that yeah, it's a, it's a harder question for me to answer, maybe a better question for a, a lawyer or somebody who's doing more work with uh, China. We have uh, no onshore presence in China, um, but the platform continues to grow really well there, and we'll probably be, 
uh, probably easier to talk about in the future, but honestly, I'm, I'm just not a good person to answer that question, unfortunately. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you guys all so much again for coming. Really smart questions. Oh. and. Oh.